okay. Um, so Exalt. So I started working on Exalt um, in 2013. So not quite as long as is uh, Elmod, but there's a connection between the two in that when I figured out how to do Spider, a colleague of mine came into my office and said, I'd like to track what we do. And um, with the spider command, I can figure out past the module files. So that's the connection. Um, and last year, uh, my same colleague who generated the Elmod uh, logo came up with this one. And I really like this um, in that the eye is also, if you look carefully, you can see that it's a magnifying glass. So Big Brother is watching. Um, so Exalt's been around a while, and then some of you have heard this talk before. It's always getting better. So I'm going to try and talk a little about that. So what Exalt is, I'm going to talk about what it is, how it works, what's new, and uh, maybe offline, uh, or what you can do with it. And um, I'm always interested in helping people get Exalt up on their system. So the point of Exalt is to understand what your users are doing. We know from accounting typically how much a particular user uses, you know, in terms of core hours, but not what they're running. So Exalt is a way to track that. So what programs and what libraries you're using? What are the top programs by core hours, by count, by users? Are users building their own program or using somebody else? What, what's the major language um, people are building in? You know, typically it's C, C++, or Fortran, although I'm sure there are some people using Rust and Go. Um, but I want to track MP, the MPI task, number of nodes, um, or function threading tracking by tracking OMP num threads, also doing some function tracking. So those are the kind of things you can do with Exalt. The design goals are to be extremely lightweight. Um, but I want to know how many, I want to know how many are using a library or an application, uh, what functions, and I want to collect this to a database for analysis. So there are two parts to Exalt. One is we hijack the linker and uh, we generate key value pairs, which I, what I call the watermark, and I embed that in the user's executable and also take that data and, and put it in a JSON format. And then also, um, if you're doing a static build, you can place code in the user's executable so it'll run before main or after main, or I have another way to do it. Um, then uh, use, a, use either a file or syslog to uh, write to the database or write, use um, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana to figure out what's going on. Kenneth and I spent a day, got something running. So it, it's, I'm not an expert on ELK, but if you know what you're doing, it's not that hard. Um, so um, since I'm the, also the LMOD developer, I have this spider tool, which allows me to connect paths to modules because Exalt just knows a particular path. It gets real paths that so says, hey, I'm from this, I am this path, and then I can use the modules of the spider table to build what I call the reverse map, which says this, um, this particular long name right here, which is PHDF5, comes from a particular PH, PHDF5 module. So I don't have to, in my head, convert these paths. I can actually have a tool that converts this. And it also helps with uh, function tracking. And if you use Tmod, you can use Lmod to build a reverse map. So you don't have to sub subject your users to the awful Lmod. Um, so you're collecting all this data, it better be useful for something. So a um, couple, you know, it's surprising to me what, how I get collected, how I get asked about my data. So, um, targeted outreach. So uh, one example was that we had a group of users using a um, chemistry code, uh, molecular dynamics code, and they were, all of them were trying to run in the large memq, 
which overloaded and our director got really excited about you know said how you know the the queue times on the on the um large mem queue was too long so we were able to figure out by exalt and another tool called tax Stats to figure out that what the codes were that were in that queue and that we were able to use tax stats to discover that they needed more memory than um, using all the cores, but if they cut the cores in half, they could uh, double the amount of memory each task had and they could fit so they could run in the normal queue and get out of the large mem queue. And I've had people come up and say, who's running NW Chem or Gromax or whatever. I had just somebody two days ago come into my office and said, hey, we found a bug in Petsy, when the core counts get really large, he wanted to know how many people were actually using Petsy with, you know, 1K, 2K, 4K, 10K um, tasks. And also, we can do uh, function tracking and find out who's using MPI3. So I was able to do some tracking. This is preliminary results, but I was able to find out how many codes we're using the MPI I things, I barrier, I all to all, I neighbor all to all, and just a few users and just a few programs. For example, MPI barrier, this first one is um, um, a, somebody doing um, machine learning. Second one is part of Parmetis. And the last two are somebody who's trying to build MPitch on our system, which is doomed to failure because mpitch won't be able to use our network hardware, but that people do this all the time. So I keep saying this, but I, when I originally wrote Elmont, Elmont, Exalt, I could only track MPI jogs by hijacking MPI run or whatever tool you had. But now we can use the ELF binary format to track jobs. So ELF is the binary format that, uh, El, uh, that Ex Lua, you, sorry, that Linux uses and it's very Baroque and it does lots of things. You can put all kinds of hooks into it. I, I only know some of them. In particular, there is this thing called the init array and the fini array. And so you can add functions to the init array and those functions get called before main. And, um, and if you, and you can also register functions to get called in the fini array and those get called after main if main completes. And so that's how Elma, I'm sorry, Exalt can hook into users' codes and track what they're doing. Um, we use Flex to do, so why? Um, Exalt is great. It can track every executable on your system. The, and that's the good news and the bad news is it can track every executable on your system and you don't want to do that. So one of the ways I do that is to ignore things I don't care about. So um, that we use uh, Flex to build a pattern recognition thing and convert that, uh, convert that into C code, which get compiled into Exalt. So it filters by based on path what programs I want to track and what programs I want to care about. So I might want to track things like user bin, tar, Perl, et cetera, but ignore everything else that's in user bin, S bin, et cetera. And so there's a configuration file. This is a, a abbreviated version of the one, the one we use. And it says, I want to, uh, the first pattern says, host names have to match this string. So our hosts, our compute node hosts are always named C, well, C three numbers, dash, and another three numbers, or, and I don't have this one here, the, the what the Cray uses, the NID numbers. So these patterns match, I'll keep the host pattern. And then um, I have um, uh, special packages R and MATLAB, which I can track um, the internals of that. And I want to keep DDT, but I want to ignore everything that's in user or in bin. And I want to track some of the environment variables, but skip most of them. Skip a lot of them, but I keep a particular few. Um, but I discovered that path selection is not enough. 
Um, turns out that uh, there's this thing called machine learning, which you may or may not have heard of. And it runs lots and lots of short programs. And I cannot track all that. Um, we also had somebody um, doing parsing or analyzing um, deep uh, dark energy um, um, uh, pictures. And they were just going through two programs ran for an hour and generated over 2 billion executables. And I just, Exalt just can't handle that. So there are filtering rules. And so these are the rules that I currently have for scalar codes, which are zero to 30 minutes. I have a one in 10,000 chance of recording it. 30 to 120 minutes is 1% and everything over 120 minutes is recorded 100%. So I can track things like Perl and Awk and Sed and Grit, Get, and I can sample people doing machine learning but not get overwhelmed by all the data. And I've discovered that e people are using short MPI programs to train deep learning engines. So um, tasks less than 256 or whatever, it's like configurable. Um, 256, I have the same rules as a scale. Well, actually, I have a different, this is old. I have different rules. I can have different, either the same rule in scalar or different rules. And then tasks greater than 256, greater than equal to 256 are always recorded because I want to record all the long running MPI jobs that never terminate. Um, so if you're a short, if you're an MPI program that has 256 tasks or less and you never terminate, then Exalt will never see you. Um, we've added tracking to, well, I've added tracking to R. I know how to do MATLAB. I'm still working on Python. I've added a signal handler and the signal handler works great for scalar programs. That is if they terminate with just about anything that will be captured. It turns out that um, I've been working with actually somebody who was on the Envapage 2 team, who's now working for us, to try and capture the long running MPI jobs. And that turns out to be much harder to do because you have to go through S run or MPI exec or whatever, and it has to pass the signals from say Slurm to the user's executable and while it does it correctly within Vapage 2, uh, can't get MPI, uh, Intel MPI to pass the signal, the terminate signal through in order to capture it. But I've also um, now with some um, help, um, and we can track singulator container usage and I'm, re I'm reducing the number of system calls to improve the speed of Exalt. So we can track R, um, the people from uh, Indiana University added the R part. They can do this by tracking um, the imports. I need to add the one for Python and MATLAB. Um, one of the cool things, one of the surprisingly cool things about Exalt is the fact that um, Exalt leaves a watermark and I've added a program that allows you to extract it. And so you can find out all kinds of things really quickly about a program about who built the program, on what machine, what modules were loaded, when it was built. So here's a small example. Um, the formatting isn't great, but you can see that it's got where the, where the program was built, the epoch, what modules were loaded, uh, what machine it was built on, who built it, what compiler built it, and so forth, and what version of Exalt recorded it. Um, we got the signal handler. Um, um, which is great. Uh, it helps tracking some things, but it's not perfect. And so um, Exalt is trying to get a flavor of what's going on. There's just too much data to collect everything. But also we can track GPU usage. So um, Exalt can be built to know about uh, NVIDIA GPUs and can say, hey, uh, this program was in the in the in, uh, GPU queue, and it did or did not use one or more GPUs. But it's got no performance data. 
because again, Exalt is, is, since it's running on everything, you want it as lightweight as possible. Uh, also, with some magic of and setting some environment variables, you can track um, the executables that happen in a singularity container, and it works well with syslogs or file transfer. And again, thanks to Scott McMillan from NVIDIA for this contribution. Um, Exalt used to use LDD to find out what shared libraries were in the executable. Um, it's now, uh, I've switched it to read proc PID maps to get that information and also to find the watermark. Um, I use the trick that OG, OGRT, is that what, uh, OG, whatever the OGRT, I think it is, um, which uses a thing known as a vendor note to get that as well. So that means I can use an ELF library call to get the watermark rather than running objdump. And this improves the penalty from exalt from being about a hundredth of a second to about a thousandth of a second. So I'm really happy about that. Um, but I've discovered that exalt allows me to be a developer on every program that's ever been out there in the sense that my code gets added to their code. And so I have to be careful about what happens. And um, a user code seg faulted with uh, exalt. Their code had a routine name random, LDD or L, yeah, lib UUID also has a routine called random. And instead of calling the system random, it called the users random, which had a different syntax and a different number of arguments and caused the code to abort immediately. So I've modified uh, exalt to no longer link user code with the lib UUID. Um, again, I've got LMOD docu or sorry, Exalt documentation tracked. So while it's not, um, it's not completely taken over the world, it's, it's getting there. And, but most of the concentration again from documentation is in the U S a little in Canada, a lot in Europe, um, some in Africa, some in, uh, the far East. Um, so the source can be found at uh, GitHub for LMOD, so you can build your reverse maps, and um, the Exalt source can be downloaded from uh, GitHub as well, and the documentation is at Read the Docs. And I'm happy to take any questions, if anybody's still awake. Uh, hi, yeah, it's a uh, great update. Um, I'm, I don't have any experience with Exalt, but um, so does it so does it make sense to use the module tracking of LMOD together with Exalt, or does Exalt actually cover also mod the tracking of module loads, even more precise maybe than uh, LMOD? So, so we do both, and we find both useful. Um, the module tracking tells you that somebody's loaded a module, but not whether they've used it. Uh, whereas Exalt will tell you if they use it, but the module tracking is so cheap um, and so useful because we've had to, we find the module tracking to be useful to tell people certain things like um, we're, so uh, a, a major difference between the way we run at TAC and maybe a lot of other systems is we tend to install our software locally. We have local disks or local SSDs, which is um, whatever the size is, no matter how big it is, it's not big enough. And so we have to remove things. I and mean, typically we have to remove compilers. And so we, been able to track compiler usage and figure out which ones to use. And that's, Exalt does not track compiler usage. So we find the module tracking data useful for that. Also, things like people are using Scalapack and have they considered uh, elemental or, you know, things like that. We've found that to be very useful. But to understand 
what people are doing with the system, we use Exalt to know things like what we're in the middle of a design for our new systems and we want to know what people are running so we can decide which programs we are going to benchmark. And Elm, the Exalt, the Elma data won't tell you, won't, aren't likely to tell you that, especially if they're building their own versions. Um, so we use both. Okay, and one follow-up question. Um, did anyone try to use the metrics you get from Exalt somehow with combination of job requirements that people submit to give some kind of dashboard where you can see someone submitted a job with, I don't know, 60 gigs, but only used, I don't know, one-tenth or a so long number of cores? So we, so we have a tool called Tax Stats which uh, which I think is great, but it has the limitation that it's limited to, I think to a sock. It used to be limited to a node. Now I think it's limited to a socket. So we only, we only allow, currently we only allow um, a, if a, no, a user is using a node, they have the whole node. Um, and so that allows us to use the hardware counters to get information about. So we tend to use tax stats to find what my colleague calls the disaster, you know, the catastrophes where they've asked for 10 nodes and only run on one core. Um, Exalt, I mean, Exalt can tell, Exalt, it lives in the user's executable. So all I really know is um, that I, I, have, um, I have this many tasks, either by MPI or number of threads. And that's all I know. I can't tell whether I am the only, I'm on, say I'm a single core job or is executable. I can't tell whether there, somebody's running parallel, you know, embarrassingly parallel runs and doing parameter sweeps and every core is under no, under, uh, under work or that I'm the only core that's doing any work. So we use tax stats for that kind of things. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so, so people are viewing remotely as well, Robert, and there's a question from via the Easy Build Slack from Olivier, who's back in, in Louvain-la-Neuve in Belgium on Elmont. And he ran into um, issues with site customization and when they switched to Elmont 8, so he was wondering whether there's something backwards incompatible in Elmot 8 that could cause this issue or it's being very, very general. So I don't have a lot of details, but. Uh, it's, uh, um, Elmod has more than 20 lines. So I'm sure, I mean, there have been subtle there. The reason why I went to Elmod 8 versus making another seven was because of the tracking of, or sorry, the embedding of the TCL interpreter into Elmod. And I changed the way that restore works. Those are the major changes that I know of. There could, there may be something, there could be, um, I mean, I'd have to see a bug report. There's nothing else that, nothing major. This is not like switching from LMOD 6 to LMOD 7. Um, so I'll submit a bug report. I assume he ran into the setting module path before kicking in LMOD problem. Which problem? Sorry? With the, the setting of module path before init, running the init script for LMOD. That may be yeah. there. There, there yes. Yeah, there's something about the, the way that that changed. Um, there's oh yeah. There's a change in the way. This is this has happened to do with. This is the way. Oh, this is the change reset. Yes, if you set. Yeah, that's the change. If I made the way, I changed the way reset work, which is this problem. Um. There's an interesting problem with hierarchy. And if somebody has a collection and the default MPI or the default compiler changes, 
it causes some interesting problems. And that's why I had to change the way reset works. And, and uh, a restore does a reset underneath if there's no collection. Yeah, okay, I hope that helps Olivier. It's not fully clear whether that's the issue, but it sounds like it could be. I have another question. Yep, Kasper van Leeuwen from Surfsera here. Hi, Robert. Um, we have actually implemented Exalt, uh, well, did the technical part. Uh, now we're looking into the GDPR issues here in, uh, in Europe. But we had one question regarding the tracking of Python modules. So from your talk, it wasn't completely clear to me. Is that already there? Should that no. already be working? Because we don't have it working. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's, it's not there. And I keep saying I'm going to do it. And I'm not quite there yet. Okay. The okay. only fact is R. Okay. Then we got put on the wrong foot because we took, a, I think, one of your configuration files and we figured, oh, there's this thing in there that says, you know, I'm gonna, I want to track Python packages, but uh, then at least it's not our problem that it's not working. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Um, the, there are, I don't fully under, I mean, I don't know how GDPR is going to affect Exalt. Yeah, um, we've been talking to uh, our legal people and our privacy officer. Um, it should be usable, um, but we have to be careful with how long do we keep individual usernames? Do we even store individual usernames or do we hash them? Uh, so probably we will go for a solution where we hash the usernames, keep that for half a year, and then maybe move the whole thing to another database when it's older than a half a year and anonymize it completely. Uh, and that is something that our legal and privacy people uh, would support. Well, so the one thing that uh, I did with Exalt One was I, um, I have some anonymization features. I, I have some tools that will allow, allow me to report how our system got used. And the way I did it was I did some anonymization of the user of usernames and anonymization of the program names. But if the program was a community code, I used its name. So VASP is VASP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think I don't think the name of the programs was that much an issue. It's more the the traceability of you know who ran it. That that is the issue. There you need to be really careful that you say, look. If you want to keep it for half a year, that's okay, but you need to have a strong motivation why it needs to be half a year. If you want to keep it for two years, it's also okay, but you need an even stronger motivation. I, I understand. And um, the only, um, yeah. Um, would, would it be possible, for example, to implement something in Exalt where we do like a hashing thing? Sure. Sure. Because that I mean, would be that would simplify our lives because we would want to do it anyway. But then you know we customize it on our end. That that's not very nice uh, when there's updates. I, um, it's on I GitHub. Think, you can open a pull request. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. open a pull request, or or you know if it, if if this is something that's interesting, I could set up monthly meetings for Exalt. Cool. Um, yeah. So, um, or or if it's just a couple one offs, I'd be happy to set up a conference call. Yeah, I think this would be a one-off. I don't think it should be a major. I mean, it should be pretty easy, I think. Right. And, and yeah, um, the only... Yeah, I think that's, you know, that should, that should mostly do it. It's just going to... Um, I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting problem that I don't have a good answer for because you're going to... Um, I guess what you do is you throw away the map after a year, right? Or after six months so yeah. that you don't know. We would even go one step further because the problem with just hashing is that if people can guess the usernames, they can redo the hash and still find the person in the database, right? And it's usually, at least on our systems, it's not that, not that difficult to guess a username because it's usually first name and then the first letter of the last name or something like that. Um, sure. So that is still privacy sensitive because people can still do it. However, sure. it's still appreciated by the privacy offer, uh, officer if you do this hashing because it makes it one step more difficult for somebody to trace who this person was. I mean, if the database sure. leaks, 
to whatever, some random place on the street. Nobody has any idea who this records belong to, so it's pretty safe. Um, right. But then we still need to anonymize completely after half a year. So then we would just generate a random number and say, look, this hash, we will always replace it with that random number. And then it's completely untraceable. Yes, but are you going to have, is McClay, let's say my username is McClay and I'm on your system. Would I get, assi would I get assigned the same random number? Every uh, time I ran? Yes, probably. But that random number, I mean, that is something we can, you know, you generate a random number on the fly. It's not based on the input, right? Oh, sure, 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 sure. And, and that's, that's why what, it's that's completely what... anonymous. In, in, uh... Yes, yes. But, you know, so if, if my magic number was 134, you could find out all the times I ran. Yeah. But you wouldn't know who I was. Yeah, exactly. I could still, uh, from the statistics, still see the uh, number of individual users for a certain software, but I have no idea who it is. Sure. Sure. That, that works. And you could, you could store in the, I mean, there's some hooks in there. You could store in the database or you could do, or you could have some separate map that says this username maps to this number. Yeah. You do that right at the beginning. Well, yeah, you could do it at the beginning. If you're willing to remember, you still have to have a map. Some place that says McClay becomes one three four. Yeah, so that's the, that's the, our plan right now. Would be to only do that after a record becomes. Uh, yeah, you still need to keep the map. That's true. Yeah, good point. And then the only thing is you need to remove a user from that map once the user leaves the system. Well, that's easy. You just remove. That's the requirement. You just, yeah, but you just all you do is just remove McClay from the map. Yeah, and it's gone because. All you know is one, three, four ran these things, but you don't know who it is. Keep the map in Git. No, I mean we need to. Yeah, it's a, okay. It's a complicated issue. We need to think about it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, well, but I'd be happy to talk about that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, more questions. Yes, um, for me. Um, so you're basically injecting your code there to uh, uh, intercept calls to like the MPI functions, right? No. No, the only thing I do is um, if it's dynamic, then all I'm doing is setting LD preload to define uh, uh, something that goes in an init array and the Fini array. And so that runs before main and after main. That's it. The only thing that gets injected permanently in the code is, are the key value pairs. Okay, and uh, so you know only that this function from MPI could be called, not that it is actually called. That's correct. So the way that works is um, the way that works is that if you turn it on, exalt. I'm sorry, I misunderstood the question. Exalt. What it does is it links your program twice, and what it does is it figures out what libraries it knows about from the reverse map and removes them from the link line and says, oh, MPI init's called or MPI I barrier's called. Um, and then, um, or there's a call to MPI init or a call to MPI I barrier. Um, and then it records that data, but it, there's no performance hit except for linking twice. Okay, so this basically only happens when you're compiling the code, not when you're running the code. Correct. There's no there's no performance hit at all. But that also it's also true that I could have an MPI barrier in my code which could never get like never get called. All right, thanks. Anybody else? More questions? If not, yeah, I think we can wrap up here. Thank you very much, Robert, for making right. the effort. Oh, you're welcome.